Hello everyone, and welcome to this tutorial on discrete Morse theory put on by the Applied Algebraic Topology Research Network. Discrete Morse theory was developed by Robin Foreman in the 1990s as an analog of smooth Morse theory. One of its most popular uses is to reduce the number of simplices in a simplicial complex by replacing it with something more manageable or to compute some homotopical information about the complex, such as its Betty numbers. We will briefly touch on how to do this in this tutorial. Let's begin with an example. Suppose we are given a simplicial complex. Maybe it's the Rips complex of a set of data points. We're often interested in those in TDA. And let's suppose we'd like to learn something about the homotopy type of this complex, possibly the Betty numbers. Consider the dark green edge and the light green face. It's not hard to see that these can be removed without affecting the homotopy type of the complex. If a P minus one simplex sigma is a subsimplex of a P simplex tau, and sigma has no other cofaces, then the pair sigma tau is called a free pair. In general, we can always remove a free pair because it corresponds to a deformation retraction, and this is a homotopy equivalence. If you know what that means, great. If not, don't worry about it. The point for now is that we can remove these free pairs without changing pertinent topological information. We'll remove that free pair, and then we'll find another free pair and remove that. The removal of a free pair is called an elementary collapse, and so what we're doing here is we are performing elementary collapses until we cannot perform any more. At this point, we are stuck, and there are no more free pairs to remove. However, what we can do is pick any edge and tear it out. Notice that this, of course, affects the homotopy type of the complex. We've killed a cycle. We will record the fact that we've ripped out an edge by keeping track of this edge in the top right-hand corner. However, now we can continue performing our elementary collapses, collapsing as far as we can until we are stuck. At this point, we will take another edge, pull it out, record it, and continue performing elementary collapses until we are left with a single point, which we will also pull out and record. Now, we seek a systematic way to describe what we've just done, and especially to see if the information we've recorded can tell us anything about the original complex. In general, then, let K be a simplicial complex. What we will do is define something called a discrete vector field on K, which is a matching of the simplices of K, satisfying the property that each simplex is in at most one matched pair. Here are four examples of a discrete vector field on the two simplex. A pair in a matching can be represented by an arrow, with the tail of the arrow starting in the lower dimensional simplex and the tip or head of the arrow moving into the higher dimensional simplex. The rule that each simplex is in at most one pair means that no two tails are coming out of one simplex, nor are two arrows entering a simplex. In addition, there is another condition that we will require. A v-path is a sequence of simplices in a discrete vector field that forms a closed loop. An example will illustrate this. The following discrete vector field is a closed v-path because if I start at any vertex and follow the arrows, I will end up at that same vertex. This is actually something we want to exclude. We will be interested in discrete vector fields that do not have closed V paths. A discrete vector field then with no closed V paths is said to be a gradient vector field. Now with this new language of gradient vector fields, we can model the sequence of collapses that we performed earlier with arrows forming a gradient vector field. Because this is a matching, there will always be some simplices that are not included in our gradient vector field. Those are shown in red, and they are, of course, precisely the simplices that we ripped out. A simplex that is not in the gradient vector field is called critical. Now, one piece of information the gradient vector field seems to be missing is the order in which we performed the collapses. If we'd like to put this information back into the picture, then rather than have arrows on the simplices, we can replace the arrows with pairs of numbers where the two simplices of a free pair are given the same value as each other. And we perform collapses by starting with the largest value and working our way down. 
when we get to a critical simplex, it is given a unique value, which corresponds to it being critical. Such a labeling is called a discrete Morse function. Formally, a real valued function on a simplicial complex is weakly increasing if subset inclusion is respected by the function. A discrete Morse function then is a weakly increasing function, which is at most two to one and satisfies the property that if F takes the same value on two simplices, then one simplex must be a subsimplex of the other. This definition is a little convoluted, but the illustration above should make it clear. Every discrete Morse function gives rise to a gradient vector field, so we can think of the two ideas interchangeably. So, what can discrete Morse functions and gradient vector fields do for us? The following theorem is due to Robin Foreman and is known as the weak discrete Morse inequalities. If we have some simplicial complex K of dimension N and a discrete Morse function or gradient vector field on K with MI critical simplices of dimension I, then the number of critical simplices bounds from above, the Betty numbers in each dimension. Furthermore, the alternating sum of the critical simplices is equal to the Euler characteristic. This means that given any discrete Morse function or gradient vector field on a simplicial complex, we can estimate the Betty numbers. For example, let's take this simplicial complex and put some random gradient vector field on it. We will color the critical vertices red, the critical edges in orange, and the critical two faces in red as well. Then the discrete Morse inequalities give us the following estimates. B0 is bounded above by 2, B1 is bounded above by 5, and B2 is bounded above by 3. Now, this is not a very good estimate, and that's because this was not a good choice of gradient vector field. Let's find a better one. This gradient vector field only has a single critical vertex and a single critical edge. So the weak Morse inequalities give us a much better estimate for the Betty numbers. In fact, they give us the Betty numbers on the nose. But there is more that discrete Morse theory can tell us. If we remove all of the free pairs, then we see that we are left with two critical simplices and that we can rebuild the simplicial complex up to homotopy from these two critical simplices. This leads to the main theorem of discrete Morse theory, which is also due to Robin Foreman. If K is a simplicial complex with a discrete Morse function or gradient vector field on it, then K is homotopy equivalent to a CW complex with exactly one cell of dimension P for each critical simplex of dimension P. Now, this does not always determine the homotopy type explicitly, but there are special cases in which we can determine the homotopy type explicitly. If we have a discrete Morse function with one critical vertex and R critical P simplices and no other critical simplices, then K is homotopy equivalent to a P-fold wedge of R spheres. One very nice application of this corollary is to compute the homotopy type of the K skeleton of the N simplex. We can define a gradient vector field by picking a vertex, in this case V0, and creating a matching with this vertex shown on the right. It can be shown that this is a matching with no closed V paths. When the smoke clears, the only things not matched are the vertex and the N choose K plus 1 K simplices. By the main theorem of discrete Morse theory, the K skeleton of the N simplex is homotopy equivalent to an N choose K plus one fold wedge of K spheres. There are many other applications as well as variations of discrete Morse theory, some of which are listed here along with standard references. And I would encourage you to take a look at them and see what discrete Morse theory can do for you.